Hi, everyone. How's it going? Um, so, yeah, I am the aforementioned Luke, uh, and I'm facilitating tonight. Um, I might throw some opinions in, but tonight's not about me. It's about these lovely guests. Um, so just to start so that you guys all know who we have here, do you guys maybe want to... Well, the main thing that we want to talk about tonight is how you guys have gone from all being fantastic performers. If you don't know these four, they're all super sick on stage, but they also do a lot off stage, behind the scenes, to the left, to the right, to the above the scenes, all the everywhere around. So what might be good is if you could take us as quickly as you can bottle it up, basically, where you were as performers, and then maybe how and what you transitioned into outside of you being the body on stage. I know, and also for you guys, a lot of you guys are still performing um, and still on stage, but yeah, how, where you came from and what you moved into, maybe? <laughs> you are the chosen one. I can't even talk on a mic. Okay, is that okay? Can everyone hear me? Uh, so my name is Jamal um, O'Driscoll. Uh, as probably many people, their story, I found uh, dance and hip hop breaking, fell in love with it, did it every day, um, and then continued to work in that and kind of tread me into a lot of different fields to being a teacher, to being a producer, to being a chair of a board, to making my own company, to being a battler, all these things that are involved in dance itself, mainly based in the Midlands. In that way. I'll be quick. I didn't expect. Um, hi, my name's Theo Theophilus. Actually, um, I uh, started off as a dancer at Boy Blue. Um, if anyone knows who Boy Blue are, no, perhaps. <laughs> um, I've, I've been there. I don't. I don't feel like I've ever, actually ever, ever left. <laughs> just, <laughs> just kind of just got, got older and needed to pay bills. But anyway, it's another story. <laughs> but. Um, from there, I was doing shows with Boy Blue, got into theatre uh, when I was about what, 18, 19. Realised I loved theatre so much, so I produced my own uh, theatre show where I fused um, Crump dance form and uh, Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth, and I fused both of those together. Um, I did an Afro-Caribbean show called Energy Squad. Um, what else did I do? I did a, a quite, I did a bit, um, but now I perform at Magic Mike Live in the West End. Um, at <laughs> and, I mean, yeah, <laughs> and I'm the choreographer for um, for Black Boys who have considered suicide when the hue gets too heavy. Um, so I choreographed that show. I've been working on that for the past five, five years since its inception, actually. Um, so that, yeah, that's me. I go? That's for you to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Nicole Latouche. Um, I started dance wise in the battle scene, actually, um, in dance hall, not hip hop. Um, culturally, my family from Dominica, small and the Caribbean, and grew up in East London. And we're a bit of a melting pot in terms of our cultural affinities, um, and grew up in Caribbean culture. And then the influence obviously of Caribbean culture in hip hop culture is very close. Um, so ended up in the crew of in initially friends and then we became a company. We were called Eccentric back in days. Um, and that was like 2010. Um, and then it was part of a collective, the London Collective, um, which was like artists who were dancers and something else. Um, and then from that group, uh, I went to uni out of London in Reading and there wasn't much dance that kind of compared to London and started to teach while I was out there. Met a really great um, choreographer, Josie Norman from Redden School of Dance, and she gave me opportunity to kind of take her school on board as my babies. Um, and yeah, we started to kind of explore theater. Um, English is my specialism in terms of education. And I've always kind of overlapped to storytelling and dance and kind of, they were my first group that I really got to test with. Um, and yeah, that opened up loads of doors when I came back to London after Reading. Um, and then I joined, I started my company while I was at uni um, in 2014. Um, and then when I got back to London in 2017, after seeing Black White Grey, um, wanted to join Boy Blue, um, which is where I know you're from. Um, and yeah, I've been with Blue since. Um, and yeah, kind of Ken and Mikey have always kind of encouraged me to 
sustain my artistry. Um, even though I've been part of their thing, I've always been quite like careful about where I place my energy and what I align myself with. Um, so yeah, even though I still am part of Blue, I've always done my own projects. So now I'm kind of producing and touring and doing stuff myself, but part of other people's stuff. And that's kind of where I'm now. And, and I'm, the head of... Oh, yeah. And now I'm the head of Academy Breaking Convention, which is... Uh, just that little thing there. Yeah, just, um, which is... Uh, it's because it's, it's a thing that isn't in yeah. the world yet, so yeah. I forget True. it. Um, but yeah, I'm now combining my education and art world with a hip hop theatre academy with Sadness and Breaking Convention. Lovely. Awesome. Miss Papio. Oh. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Ola. It's so funny because I'm so into like what I'm doing right now in my life that whenever someone's like, so what have you done so far? I'm like, ah. <laughs> um, but I'm originally from Poland and I moved to London in 2013. So it's been 11 years. Oh, wow. And initially I treated moving to London as my last last kind of chance to work as a dancer and to make my dance make my living dance because in Poland you don't really there's not really a career that you can that can sustain you for for the longest time that makes sense so I was like let's try this my mom was a bit like what are you doing but I was like I'm going <laughs> and kind of it took me about three years to went full freelance and and sustain my life here through dance I did a lot of a lot of mostly commercial jobs, a little bit here and there when it comes to hip hop theater as well. Um, but I also, I was always a passionate teacher. I started teaching very early, but not just because I needed a job as a dancer, it's just because I always wanted to share. If I've learned something, I always was thinking about someone I can teach it to or like make someone better. I think maximizing people's potential is something that I'm genuinely just passionate about and that's like my purpose. Like in general, I feel my purpose is helping other people. It, and now I found another way. So during COVID, when everything was closed, I started, started missing that. I started missing sharing with people, started miss, missing teaching, and I was looking for another way that I can help. And because it was such a, such a troubling period and there was so much information online, people telling other people what to do, I kind of wanted to help people to figure out what they want to do themselves. Like, what do you personally want to do in the situation? And that's how I came across coaching, which is phenomenal in that way, because it helps everyone kind of look within themselves. It's kind of like putting mirror in front of someone and just asking the question that will help you answer them in your personal way. I've become really passionate about that, finished my course and started working with a lot of a lot of dancers and just grew in the understanding how much power that has and how reinforcing it can be for people. And and that led me to creating the whole thing, <laughs> creating the whole platform, which is called We Grow Through 60 that we started actually this year, but we've been working on it for a year before that, because it always takes loads of time to prepare these things and been really happy growing this platform. And it's just the beginning. And like, as soon as it started, I already realized that this is going to be so much more than that. So it started like a thought to do this and now it's happening and I'm like, oh wow, I have so many more thoughts now <laughs> and there's so many more things I can do. I'm not gonna say anything yet, but it's something I'm really passionate about and gonna grow this and hopefully will help dancers in many different aspects that are not necessarily physical, but everything around our careers, our life, lifestyles and just everything that we do about dance that can be of a source, of a tool, of a resource, that's the word. And on the top of that, I'm transitioning into choreographing. I'm currently choreographing a hip hop theater show, which makes me incredibly happy. Even if you work so many hours and your brain ends up being like a little mashed potato by the end of the day, I'm just so happy. So I think my life naturally turned into what I love to do when I released what I thought I should have done or what I should be doing as a dancer. As soon as I released it, the right things came to me. So now I'm a very happy person creating my own stuff. <laughs> that was long, Boom. sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, so this is like for whoever, you guys can jump in as and when you want this. No, I'm not going to say. Now you. Um, but uh, so obviously you guys all started off dancers and wanting to be dancers, battle scene, choreo scene, doing that type of thing. At which point would you say that you thought about the option or it became appealing to you to do things 
not on stage? Like, were you from the beginning, you're like, all right, I want to dance, but I also want to do blah, 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 blah. Or did you get to a point where you were like, right, I've had enough of this performing stuff. Let me do something else. Or were you like, right, this is fun, but let me think. Was it a, a more of a long-term plan? Was there like, talk me through the thinking that transitioned you out of only wanting to be a performer, whoever. Okay, I can jump on this. I'll jump on this Hit it. first one. Hit it. I thought if I've been, okay, rewind. <laughs> as I grew as a dancer, I've been told that if I want to be a dancer, I need to do only dancing. I need to think about dance, I need to breathe dance, I need to just do dance. And if I ever thought about doing something else, that means I didn't do well in dance. Or I wasn't, I don't know, dancing enough. I don't know, something super, super weird and it didn't make sense, but I kind of like committed to it. And at some point, I, I knew I have potential to do more. I knew I wanted to explore more. I'm like an eager learner. I like to learn new things. I like to explore my own personal strengths in different ways. But I was just hanging. I was just hanging on to dance for the next job, for the next gig, for something. And like I mentioned just before, as soon as I released that need of trying to prove myself as a dancer, I realized I can do so much more that can make me happy and make others happy. So I think for me, it was just a personal journey of self-development where I realized that I'm not meant to only dance and that's okay and that's what's gonna make me happy. Mm. And at what point did you, like, how old were you? How long had you been in dancing? Was this early or late? I think around, around when I was 30. Oh my God, I said <laughs> it. When I hit 30, I did like my biggest dance jobs. I was thinking, oh my God, now I did this big dance job more dance jobs are gonna flow in, you know? That's how it goes. And then nothing, <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so I went traveling, cause I was like, let me just leave. <laughs> I went traveling for two months. I came back and I was like, okay, so this clearly didn't go how I thought it was gonna be, cause I thought I'm gonna just, just jump from job to another job. And I think that was the moment when I was like, okay, let me just, hold on, let me just pause. Let me just rethink this. Let me just, what am I trying to prove? What am I, what am I waiting for? Mm. And that's where I was like, but what can I do? I, I like I don't like waiting for no one. Boom. If I ask someone, do you want to go travel? Uh, I'm I'm already gone. I'm already traveling. I'm not waiting for no one. <laughs> I moved to London the same way. Like I, do, I cannot do it. So this was the moment for me to realize like what am I waiting for? There's so many things about me that I haven't explored in my life. I've been exploring this dance passion. Great. I've been exploring living in a different country. Great. But I have not explored the talents that I have that are not physically dance related, but can use into the dance world, that I can use my own talents to pour into that, to help people and kind of find different ways. So I think it was just a curiosity of my own self that started the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was really interesting to listen to. Um, because I think I was really opposite. I, I never had the option to only dance. Mm. Um, I've always kind of done dance. Initially dance was kind of like an extracurricular thing. Um, so yeah, very Caribbean parents, you do your academics, you do your maths, your science, you, you stick to your books. And I was quite a naturally able student, like GCSEs and all of that. But I think because I had to self-fund my training and I would be like tutoring on a weekend to pay for class and, and do all of these things. So I very early, I think 17, I started working. Um, I had a portfolio career at 17, mm. technically. Um, so I've kind of sustained that through my whole working career for the last 13 years, cause I'm 30 now. Um, and I've always thought about the different art things that I've always, you know, kind of collaborated in as art forms and languages, as opposed to them being like a career lane. Um, so dance was actually my second art. I started in poetry on stage, um, but I found when I got to about 25, yeah, it must've been 25. The freebies stop at 25, because yeah. youth ends apparently at 25. It's now 30 in some organizations, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm really aware of socioeconomic boundaries and, and barriers to entrance into our scene. Um, and when you're self-funded and independent, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of barriers that you, you're up against. And I think for me, it was always, I, I live by like who said ism. And it's like, if someone tells me I can't train blah, blah, blah at said age, who said? 
said who. Um, so I've done things kind of backwards in reverse. Like I won't go to classical training now at 30 and start a ballet class because yeah. if for me, it gives me a discipline and strength in my body that my body needs to do a hip hop show or whatever stuff I'm choreographing now, I'll do it that way around. Um, but I think that transition away from the stage, um, working commercially, was very interesting, especially as like a black female in that world. I didn't have locks then, but I had like a big afro of curly hair and you get boxed into categories based on your image in that world specifically. And there were just certain things I wouldn't compromise on just because I know what I want to represent mm -hmm. um, in terms of like physically. Um, and that very much like superficial engagement with us as artists really kind of deterred me from that world for a while. The class scene became very like film it all and the training stopped. Like I used to go to classes where you'd come home with homework and you didn't kill the class and, and you'd go home and drill that for next time. Now it's like you're, you're easy class and you want to just do that to film sake. And for me that stopped being why I trained. Um, so that kind of shifted me away from the stage, but I then wanted to find movement that felt more intuitive. And that actually brought me more to theatrical work and, and solo work, which kind of brought me back in a very different way. So now I can't dance for the sake of it being showcase, but it's more dancing for saying something. Mm. I think a little bit more similar. Um, mic's out, is it on? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, backwards, I think, for example, I didn't start calling myself a dance artist till like two years ago, but I've been dancing over 12 years. Um, Wait, say that again. You didn't do- you I didn't, didn't call myself an artist until oh, about two, three years ago. How come? Um, I think coming from like I, I didn't come up in like theater or any kind of that training. Right. Like I did, I did ballet, tap on all that stuff. And as soon as I did like a week intensive, like Marcin Riviera, if you know, for like a week. And as soon as I found breaking, I just did that. Oh, so you more thought of yourself as like a battler than an artist? Not even a battler. Oh. I just love breaking. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and like uh, with my crew, they were all like older than me. They had all gone to university or had like specialisms. And I was just around these like real role models. And because of breaking, I then went to university. Before that, it wasn't really a, a thing for me. Mm. I started battling now. Just I basically got ADHD. I didn't really know at the time, so I went to university and dyslexia. So mm. I just I just breaked, and I loved the play in it. So I just did that, and like my first battle I won, I was able to go to Estonia. They paid for me to go. That's the first time I left the country. Mm. So then it just was like ingrained in me to just I just do this thing, wow. and then that's how it kind of goes. And because of the people I met, I just had, kind of had like a family of people that we all did this thing, mm. and then because they had specialisms in it, or well, they kept moving forward. It was just something that was like, it's been a lifestyle since then. So I didn't really call myself anything. I never did a dance job in that to that to a long period. And then it was only because people would just go, you know, I went to BOA and people went to vocational and they're like, they don't do breaking a vocational. So like, scrap them, bro. Cause I want to do this, you know what I mean? Like I want to do this and then end up doing a lot of educational stuff, a lot of outreach. Um, I wanted to work with a lot of young people that I knew that this dance form or this way of working could be a benefit, like beneficiary. Like it saves me from doing stuff. I know I'm doing a piece in a little bit and it's a little bit about that process. Mm -hmm. And from building that, actually all my other jobs came before I ever become a dance artist. That's the last part. So I started working in an organization as a dancer, as a mentor, um, helping different organizations on the side. And it wasn't until someone said, do you want to do a dancer? Do you want to make your own theater? And my dad passed away. I ended up starting my own company. So I used to work in uh, SEND, like units and stuff in schools because I wanted to share what it was. And I was like, oh, but if I make like a show about it, I can maybe even show another way to bring that communication. Mm -hmm. And then the ball just kept rolling like that. It was all through authentic communications. It never went in my head, I'm going to do dance as a career because I knew I never wanted to take a job and feel like a clown a little bit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I was, and I knew I couldn't do anything else really. Five, six, seven, eight, leave me with that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just let me, just let me go off, you know yeah. what I mean? A little bit. And when people come in like, you gotta come in and drill? Nah, that's not for <laughs> me, man. I drill, I know breaking, but I'm like, I do it with a love and a passion. Yeah. And then from there, the theater then grew. And I was like, oh, this is a different way to tell stories and narrative. Mm. And with the power of dance, it's like, I don't have to say anything. I can just go on there and be myself and share a story and be an example that way. 
and then just kind of building up real authentic relationships are able to just do weird jobs and help people and like you said be a chair of the board and that's just for authentic i'm a chair of board called spectra is an inclusive dance company that works with young people that are on the spectrum and vulnerable adults and that was just through working through that and i can support that way and producing working with emily end up being running on festivals doing outreach programs i run you dance west midlands and all them kind of things so did you make a conscious decision to move into off stage things or did it kind of just it was just like in order to help the people i want to help i can tell stories on stage i can do this yeah, i can also literally that and make shows with my friends mm. it was like oh sit oh they like this show oh they, they want to do it as well oh breaking convention oh bruv this is mad isn't it <laughs> do you get me like and i was like and i was so like birmingham centric yeah like not in a rude way for the londoners all good, all good. i was like i ain't going up there i'm not i'm the one that's not gonna do it you know what i mean like and like whenever you go there it's violence do you know what i mean like it's same like if you go to battle whatever that was just like it was sick in my head whatever it is and and when you're from a city or whatever i think people that know it's sometimes seen as a tougher to do like live a dance yeah. lifestyle unless you're teaching and things like that so and i love that side of it but it's even like a big part of what i do now is trying to teach the people that don't do dance because that's like a separate skill in itself mm -hmm. do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's more of them kind of through them pathways i was like how can i draw people in and just be able to make work with my friends and be able to connect to people like thankfully like nationally uh, body politics are in the building for example mm -hmm. and just like you're able to connect and go hey, let's go on this road and somehow i'm still here still doing little pieces so i'm just saying it's a real backwards journey right. and i was never like auditions miss me with all that because yeah. i ain't no good man my radiant head is just gone i ain't got it <laughs> <laughs> yeah man i um it's a little bit different for me i had to make a decision i grew up in both a caribbean and african household and my mom's jamaican and my dad's nigerian and anyone that knows a uh, Nigerian man that comes to the UK for the very first time, he only knows education <laughs> and he only knows that academics is what you need. So when I told my parents that I was coming, uh, I was going to dance classes for the very st first time, they saw it as just like something I was just doing as like a hobby um, until I started making it more than just a hobby, like I was battling in dance. Um, and I would stay behind after school, dancing and training, um, going to different competitions at that, at that age, staying up till like four or five o'clock, watching like jump off videos, because I wasn't old enough to go to, at, at, at the time until we was, and then we actually competed at jump off. Um, yeah, I had to make a decision. If I'm gonna do dance, then I need to make this work. Like there was no other way like my dad was he wasn't the guy to tell him that oh, i'm gonna just do dance on the weekend and then so how are you gonna put food on the table like it was that real conversation with me at the age of 16 17 and when i and i still at 18 i said i'm gonna prove you wrong i'm gonna prove you wrong i'm gonna prove you wrong and yeah my mum, my mum was a little bit different she supported she never got it but she took me to all of my classes. From Monday through to Sunday, I had training every single day in different spaces. Um, some that they needed like submissions for and some that didn't need submissions and through just training with our friends, just being able to just have that fulfillment of doing something good for yourself and also um, putting an, an energy into something else. Like growing up in London where it is tough and violent, it's like you, you can easily fall and go. I went to a boys' school, it could, you could easily go down the wrong route very easily. Like it almost happened to me. And it was still trying to get at me even while I was dancing. Um, so I needed to make it work. So I remember being on a bus with my best friend at the age of 18 and saying to him, I'm going to do dance, you know, I'm going to dance like full time properly. And then I bought my first job at Move It and I made 500 pounds for the weekend. I was like, get in, yeah. <laughs> so since, do you know what I mean? <laughs> well, that was a T-Mobile though. So that, they were like a, yeah. So move, I'll, move it weren't trying to do that for us <laughs> as dancers. Wow. Yeah, straight. But um, so from a very early age, I've always been business minded with my dance because I was, I was forced to. Um, so yeah, like there wasn't, 
I've always been looking at the other aspects of dance, like the producing aspects of dance, the the how can I make this sustainable? Okay, lockdown's here now. Okay, cool. How can I go online? How can I digitalize my work? How can I have an archive of work that people can then just look at? Um, my mind's constantly ticking. And all the while, I enjoy it because I love doing what I do and I love creating. Um, so it was always on the forefront of my mind. I never had a route, I never know. I had a know-how because I felt like I was carving my own path. The only people that I had in front of me were other black men like Mikey and Kenrick that had got um, MBEs and Olivier Award winners um, at the time of me growing up. And I ain't seen any other black choreographers that's come from my background winning anything like that. So I knew it was possible. They were my first entrance into like, if they can do it, I can do it. So the representation for me really mattered. Um, so yeah, I've just been riding that wave. Sick, and that actually brings me onto something I was gonna ask you guys about anyway. But before I say that, just because I'm listening also, and I'm listening with the ears of people that maybe are younger in their career and something, one thing I do wanna mention is that, and you guys can hopefully agree with me on this, but all of the journeys that you, I haven't really spoke about my journey, but like all of our journeys, when we speak about them like this in a very panel talky, we know what we're talking about setting, which we, I would say we do in our respective fields, but the journey hasn't been linear to get there, right? It, I think when you look back, it's easy to sum your journey up like it's a storybook and be like, I was always destined for this and this is how I was and blah, blah. At the time, we never knew that. Like we didn't know we were entrepreneurs in the making. We were lost and scared and worried. And then you figure it out and figure it out and figure it out. And then the process of figuring it out, all those things, and this is at least, you know, if you guys disagree, tell me, but like all of those things that were challenges and that were scary and that I was like, I'm lost or uh, I don't know what I'm doing was actually me carving my own lane or me doing something new that people hadn't done before. And it's like, it's scary because that path hasn't been walked before and you're lost because you're learning. And you know what I mean? And it's at the time, it doesn't feel like an inspirational story. It feels like rubbish right but then you look back and over you know if you keep pushing through each of these challenges and you keep you know finding the answer to that problem in front of you um you're gonna then look back and go oh that was a moment when i became this person that was a moment when i became this that was and then you look back hopefully at kind of our a bit a little bit older ages and you go damn i have a career or damn i I learned so much and it's like, it only happens from all those lost, scared, confused moments. And I think people tend to think they're the only ones that are lost and scared because we're sitting here talking like, and then I did this and then I did this. But that's only because hindsight is twenty twenty. It's not um, It's not how it felt at the time. But yeah, so I just wanted to say, because all of you guys are mad inspirational. So <laughs> like hearing it, I just wanted to also, if anyone's sitting there going, yeah, but I'm just some person. Yeah, we all are just some person, but we get to these positions to the head of, you know, Breaking Convention Academy or whatever by doing these little things and just, you know, overcoming the little moments, you know? I think I just want to say like, you don't know, I think we are on a path if we if you keep working on what you th on yourself and your craft, the right things are going to come to you at the right time. And the most annoying thing is that time only was going to show you. But we live in a very quick world right now, so it changed. Like when I was younger, it wasn't as quick. So now everything is quick, so it's harder to keep patience. But I always say patience is a virtue because universe needs its time as well to figure out what's what's good for us as well to like bring it to the table. Yeah, and there's something that I, you know, tell myself or that other people have told me a lot, which is like, the when you're at a moment where you find something hard or whatever, like the reason not a lot of people are successful is because they give up when they're lost. It's not about like, if you know what you're doing and you're like, right, I have to choreograph this show and it's really hard. And like, that's a achievable challenge because by the time you're in that position to, to choreograph the show, that's for a reason, because you're a good choreographer. We know. So yes, it's a challenge, but it's an achievable challenge. But the point where you're like, all right, I'm doing something new, I'm lost, I don't know what I'm doing, like I'm moving to London, what do I do? The reason there's not, uh, there's a small percentage of successful people is because most people see that and go, now I'll get a job. You know what I mean? And I think that's like, the, overcoming those lost moments is the hard work that we talk about. You know what I mean? As much as it is being every day in the gym or in the studio or working on your craft, it also is figuring out 
why you feel so lost, you know? And I think that's such a thing that we gloss over a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's a caveat for all of us. It's like, give yourself grace um, and you don't have to figure it out. Like I'm 30 and yeah, I might. And it's funny cause I forgot that I'm the head of Academy <laughs> Baking Convention. And it's not because for me, it's not a thing. It's because I'm not the things I do. And that's really, I've separated the two things. So I don't pour my sense of self into my titles. I'm not attached to the things that people on paper maybe think are what makes me me. I've, I've really gone inward and, and figured out my why. And that is just in everything I do. So for me, as long as joy, compassion and empathy is there, that's what I do. You know, and, and I think it's funny, like, you know, when you have to write your artist blurb and your little bios, like, I always put a caveat line at the bottom and it's a PS, but actually the PS is the reduced down version. I think my current one is like, uh, bad girl shaking tables with radical acts of love or something like that right now. But that's really what I do right now, because you can write it all in these flowery ways and these fancy words and these big terms and these titles, but really the essence of what you're doing is integrally linked to you, the person. And I think being lost is part of the process and, and you don't have to attach to a career. Like, I don't think I've ever thought of anything I do as a career. I still question, is it a career? Because they're just things I do. Mm. And they're just all parts of what I like to do. They're not really like my job title. And I always think like, and I guess it's a bit morbid to think about it this way, but like at my funeral, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's an exercise that I read in like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Great book, buy it please. Um, but if you went to your funeral, what would people, what would you want people to say about you? And if you're not living your life aligned to that, what are we doing? You know, and it's, it's a, I guess, morbid way to think of it, but like, that's what you leave people with. You know, it's not, they're not gonna say, oh, she was the head of, when I'm gone, they're gonna say of how I made them feel or what they connected with and all of those things. So that's my why. 100%. And I think like just to to add like kind of my mentality on the performer slash other things that I've done is like the way I, and the way I would advise people to do it is like, like you said, not worry about the type, like, oh, I wanna be a graphic designer. I wanna be this because you can be anything and you can be multiple things. But I think the main thing is like, what do you enjoy doing? And for anything that you enjoy doing, there's a job for that. You know what I mean? So you're like, oh yeah, like I'm a performer, but like I always enjoy like sitting and watching the makeup art. Okay, you're a makeup artist. Or like, you know what I mean? Or you could get into that. Or, oh yeah, I, I really enjoy, like a lot of people that I've spoke to, like young people outside of dance, you know, it's like, oh, what do I like to do? Uh, what do you like to do? And they're like, oh, uh, I don't know. I just like to go out drinking every weekend. Okay, cool. Fine, we all do when we're like 18 and whatever, but maybe you're gonna be like a, a cocktail person. You know, you look, like, I've got a friend um, that makes cocktails professionally and he loves it and he knows the history of every cocktail and this and he's passionate about that. And I'm like, cool, maybe you're into like being a bartender or making drinks, you know? Oh, I like driving my friends around and stuff. Okay, maybe you wanna do something with that, you know? Like whatever your passion is, I think there's something to fulfill that um, and inside and outside of the dance world. So I think that that's also the important, if you love music, it's like, then nowadays there's a whole career of like making music for dancers or whatever. So yeah, I think like what you were saying, especially it's not only the like reflection, but it's also the like, it can be the drive. It's like, who do I wanna be in this world? Or like, I wanna be someone that helps people achieve their potential. Cool, we'll figure out the logistics later. That's what we're focusing on. Do you know what I mean? It's like, help people achieve their potential. How is just logistics, but the the, the passion, the why is the, the driver, I think. But yeah, sorry, to go back to what you said that made me think of what I was gonna ask you guys is about money. So again, something that I think we don't talk a lot about and we don't talk honestly about. Um, we go 360 does in their program, so plug that. Um, but how much of a, I know you kind of already mentioned this, but maybe you can uh, elaborate on it, but how much did money and, you know, growing up and learning what council tax was um, make you want to diversify your portfolio? Was it, because I know especially me being, I did choreo, but a lot of my life has been spent in the battle scene. And at some point you go, I just did eight hours work for a hundred quid. And 
yeah, minus tax <laughs> and my food and my travel. So I made a grand total of 30 quid today and made this whole event look good. Do you know what I mean? So at some point I was like, right, there's got to be something I can build out. And a lot of people, I think, reach that where they're like, right, I'm going to use the battle scene to promote myself or whatever. But did you get to a point where you're like, right, the money situation had to had to come into play at some point. We're all old enough that we, you know, pay council tax and moved out and have to pay bills and all that stuff. Um, you got that to look forward to, young people. But yeah, talk to me about money. <laughs> money, yes. Um, I didn't know a lot about money growing up. Didn't know what its use, what, what it was for until um, I, st I started running my own place. I was, I was like, I'm moving out, I'm leaving home. I'm, I'm, I've had enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool, bro. <laughs> I don't have a job. Um, I don't have a job, and I thought, you know, this five hundred pound from the T-Mobile job is gonna, <laughs> it's gonna stretch. It's gonna stretch. So what I did do, um, what I did do, I started to look at dance jobs specifically, and their pay, their pay um, brackets and what they were getting paid. Cause I was like, nah, there's just no way that you can be a dancer and you could just be brown. And obviously in the, in the industry, you're looking at big choreographers like Akram Khan, you know, um, Hoffa Schechter, um, Ashley Banjo, and all of these other choreographers that are just like, they look comfy. <laughs> they look good. <laughs> I want to be good too. <laughs> How do I do this? And you can see through their work, there's different energies in their work. You see if it's a contemporary background, a ballet background, or street dance, and there's different routes for certain things. If you're gonna go through the commercial route and making work for television specifically, or making work for television and the stage and for concerts, you gotta look at how you wanna make your a name for yourself. And that was what I did. I, I wanted to make a name for myself. So I entered the battle seed hard. And I remember I lost, <laughs> I lost quite a few times to him. I remember. <laughs> I was on the receiving end of that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just, I was just fulfilling my dream, you know what I mean? But um, I gave myself an alias. So some people might know me as Godson, um, which was given to me by Kenrick. And I was like, why are you giving me the name Godson? Like, what does Godson mean? But my actual name, Theophilus, which is quite... Um, bit of a weird one. Theophilus means love and friend of God. Um, so I kept it. So I was like, God son, okay, cool, brand, go. <laughs> battle, battle, and then got to dance, Sky One's got to dance came about, and I was like, oh, TV. I know they're making some serious bread over there. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna go one man up. <laughs> solo, I did a solo, I went back, I went back with Turbo. I was like, bro, we can make some shows after this because you see the fan base that we're gonna build up in this. We can make a show, we can have like a cult following for Turbo and God's side, yes! <laughs> that didn't happen. <laughs> um, I got to the finals, I've got to dance as a solo, and then I was just like, I was teaching up in Scotland. Um, I was selling C Crump CDs, five packs. If you came to my class, you got free CDs because you paid. Like, I was thinking about it all. Okay, <laughs> hustling. Always understand when you're running your own. When you are your business, it's crazy because <laughs> you start mixing business and emotions together, and that's not a healthy balance. It's really not. So I started taking that emotional side and started giving myself goals because I realized that my emotion, my emotional value, started to get in the way of how I was working with business. So I started to give myself financial goals every checkpoint. So every half year, so I get to summer because summer for me, by habit and pattern, was the most time I spend the most money because everybody's outside. Everyone wants to drink and have ice lolly. So my checkpoint was spring and summer. What's the bank account saying? Where am I going past this point? What jobs are coming in? What jobs are going out? Et cetera, et cetera. So by midpoint and then by just before Christmas, because you know that's another financial check that's going out. <laughs> Fin yeah, just gotta have goals. So what's helped me sustain up until this point today is setting those financial goals and not making them unattainable. If it's 10 pound, it's gonna be 10 pound strong in my account. So not saying to yourself, oh, it's gonna be 100 grand. No, think about what you have 
what contracts have you already signed? Okay, cool. Where's your outgoing? So it's about budgeting. Just which made me fall in love with producing. Um, so I started to budget my life. I started to realize I'm spending way too much money on my life. <laughs> I need to hold back um, and start either upskilling myself so I can be better and more attractive as an employee because no one cares about what, who you are, where you are, or what name you've built for yourself or what battle you've won. No one cares about that. What can you deliver to this business or what can you put into the world? What can you give back into the world? Um, so again, I'm still there. I'm not saying I've got it figured out. It's just been what's working for me <laughs> up until this point. I still need to do some things. But um, I started there and um, I'm still on the journey with money, if it's I'm honest. It's a bit never-ending, eh? It's never-ending, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, oh, you're back. <laughs> um, I think, okay, so, I was always when I grew up, when I was growing up my my parents were always trying to put that make sure you have savings don't spend too much money we don't have money just these kind of narratives that were like put into my brain we were fine but it's just a narrative that was constant of like just be aware of your money always have something to fall on make sure you have a steady job da 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 just kind of like that fear so when I moved out I was like I'm not taking this fear with me on my back. I know I'm in a different country and I need to have a full-time job at the beginning, get myself, just be able to live in London. My day it's a crazy expensive city. So I worked hard to, to get the money, but I was kind of just, I just want to be able to live my life. So I was just, I was never really into savings for the first few years. I was just kind of like, I want to make a living. I'm in London, I need to stay afloat. My journey was to go from full-time job to full freelance, it took me three years, I did full freelance. And then it was just a bit of a journey of kind of just being being able to keep doing this, being able to keep being in London, being able to get more jobs. So I wasn't really business minded. And if I could turn back time, I would. <laughs> now I'm paying, like now I'm learning everything and I always say to my, myself, I wish, but it's fine. Like it was meant to be that way. I think now I'm getting into, into the times when I'm like, okay, we have to be just a little bit more business minded. I was always business minded, but not financially, if that makes sense. I was always working for myself as a business, but the money side, I was just like, oh, I don't want to think about it. I'm, I have it good, I can live good. And then, oh, I have money to travel for two months, great, boom. I come back, I have no savings, inflation, no problem. Let's 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 try it. So that, that kind of got me to the point last year when I was like, okay, inflation, everything is crazy. And I was really struggling last year. And it was just last year, we were just talking about ups and downs. You never like really up and then you go up. You know, I was in a really high point, got the money, went traveling, got back. Wow, there's nothing coming in. I thought it will be coming in. What do I do? I plant the seeds, I work hard again. You know, like I, I keep going back on that, on that grind. But I also was thinking, what can I do better to not put myself into the same position anymore? Because it's just ain't right. And I started learning about, about, like, about upskilling and obviously learning different things. But one thing I've learned the other day, um, from I actually I'm a big fan of Stephen Bartlett like I really do follow the guy because I think he has a lot to say that we could use as freelancers and artists that we are not being taught that it's great to learn two skills at the same time so a lot of times we focus on dance and this is our one skill we go for but logistically and life to to have your livelihood going a little bit better when you have two skills you're offering something unique you're offering as a business is unique because you have a dance and podcast producing dance and videography dance and photography dance and whatever like name it whatever you were naming before i think that gives you that your business unique offering and it's about what you what's unique about you because i'm not gonna lie i believe it's a bit harder for women to 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 get that spotlight to be a little bit more of like we're gonna go to go to dance as a soloist and, and make money because I think it's just a little bit different on our side of so many female dancers and it's just a little bit harder to get above the sea of wonderful and amazing talented people. Um, so I think just being smart about what you're learning and why and what you want it to do for you in the future. What would you like it for for it to to do for you in the future? That's English, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you know it's really um, important that I think like you can you 
I talk endlessly about marketing and branding, right? I'm not going to talk about it today, but just so you know, this is like my passion in life. But the thing with the two skills thing, which is really interesting, is like, as if you're a dancer and you do anything else, I do three or four other things outside of dance, right? I In those things, I'm a dance specialist, if you know what I mean. So I, as a videographer, I'm a dance specialist videographer. As a podcast host, I'm a dance specialist. So just by doing the other thing, and like you said, combining the two skills, I'm an expert in something. So I've carved, like I was, I've been in so many situations with, as a videographer where I am, to be completely honest with you, super out of my depth. I'm around people that, I did a job once with the guy who produced um, visuals for like a Kanye tour and some other stuff. I'm still figuring out what my camera does at this point. And I'm like, and he, I'm his assistant. But it, the, the reason I'm with him is because he, we were shooting something about dance and he's not a dancer. So at first I was like, I don't know what I'm talking about, basically. That was in my head, uh, imposter syndrome. I, I don't know what I'm doing. But then he goes like, oh, like, you know, what does this guy do? It's a breaker. And I'm like, well, uh, I don't know, but like I would shoot the breaker a bit low upwards because they're going to be on the floor. Like, so he does it and he's like, oh, bro, this looks sick. And I'm like, oh, okay. And then I'm like, well, a popper, they're maybe going to do the top. Like, so because I just knew this, which to me is basic, as I was giving him the stuff, he was coming to me going, all right, that guy, like, how would you shoot that guy? And it's like maybe a crumper or whatever. Like I would know, okay, I'm gonna get close to a crumper because they're moving slow. At any moment, those arms might swing. So I need to be ready to jump back. Whereas a popper is not gonna have that outburst, right? So those sort of things, I started to realize, oh, I am kind of an expert when I'm not in the dance field, you know? And if I combine it and then like as a dancer, I know about filming, which other dancers don't know about. So I think I've, all of this is to back up your point, but like when you combine two things, not only do you have something unique being able to do the both, but in each one, you're an expert in the other thing. You know, if you're a music producer that works with like Mikey, Mikey's not only a fantastic music producer, he's an expert in music production for dancers, which is like unbeatable. Cause then who else are you gonna get? It's like the only yeah. that person that can do both. The, the unique offering, but also just one thing I want to add and something that I realized realizing this year very, very strongly is that your real currency is the relationships you build around your career. Money, money aside, mm. relationships you build around your career are one of the most important things. And you can build yourself, your business, your money, your, your everything. You, it's literally like I'm realizing that, that the people around you, people you work with, people you build your network around, your network, your your network is your net worth. <laughs> Honestly, hundred percent. So I would I would think about that as money from today. <laughs> Let's hold that because I do want to come back to relationship. But I want to hear from you guys about the when money. did or didn't money come into play, or uh, what was your relationship like with yeah. the business side of it? Um, it was always in play for me. Um. I think it's never been my driver, but I've I've self-funded mm. my majority of my career. So I've always, I'm from East London, I'm from Hackney. And I say that because I've grown up amongst people that hustle uh, and, and are very entrepreneurial minded in their survival instinct. Um, so th we've had to find ways to make means in, in many ways. And I think one of the things that me and my friends always joke about is like, we never knew we were poor. Do you know what I mean? And like our parents never allowed us to know poverty, mm. but they managed to make means. But, and I think the, the ability to mask your social circumstance and still allow there to be play and joy and freedom is a beautiful skill. And I think when I heard adults like coming back and being like, oh, I hate work. And I always said to myself, I never wanna be one of those adults. Like I never wanna be one of those people who are doing a job just to, to get by. Like, you don't I, have to be. You don't have you to don't. be. But I do also understand not everybody has the, the freedom to choose when they, when they want to. So I was very, um, a transferable skill. Like I, that's been my pillar in everywhere I go. Like you can, I would say I got my discipline from basketball. And, and knowing how to work in the team and knowing your part played in a bigger thing to win a game, to contribute to a long-term goal of like winning the league, etc. I used to play for Haringey Angels, top female team. We, I mean, we might have played your guys team. We might have. <laughs> um, but like knowing you've got skill sets from something totally different. Like you could have been, I'm a firstborn child. I have younger siblings. Knowing how to 
be a role model, knowing how you're setting a bar for someone looking up to you, but also knowing to manage your own pressure and all of those things. That's a skill set I've just learned by being a sibling, mm. but actually that's transferred into other realms and, and being a poet, I've gotten comfortable talking in front of people, but my English teacher didn't know, put me on the stage at 14 just to read a poem was gonna give me self presenting skills. Do you know what I mean? And I think we don't focus enough on one skill opening up several doors. Um, and I think that's been my biggest money maker um, is sending an email, like actually just see an opportunity in Reading. I ended up teaching five classes. If I was in London, there was no, what, five what classes? Our scene is so saturated mm -hmm. that we should, for me, in my opinion, we're fighting for the same audiences in London at the moment where we could be sharing classes and that sustains us healthier careers, et cetera. When I was in Reading, there was hardly any classes that offered what I wanted to see. So I was teaching an experimental musicality class, a commercial class, a Afro dance class, like so many different things because it just wasn't there. But that all came off the back of me saying, hi, um, I'm a uni student and there's sports classes. I, I noticed you don't have this, are you interested? Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, I have all four, you know? And I needed to do that because I was funding my way through uni at the time and doing that and modeling on the weekends for carnival because that's my culture and do, going back to London on the child ticket um, to like tutor English and maths because I was good at English and maths. And I think you can utilize your different skill sets to like make ends meet, but knowing they, they, they sit in different Pockets is, is a really good skill. And my friend, um, Caleb Femi, he's a poet, dope poet, dope artist. He said, if you wanna figure out your financial projection for a year, and I've kept, like, kept this figure and bring it wherever I go. He said, figure out what you wanna make in a year. Take away all the days of the year you want off. So you don't work, take that away. Then that's the days you have off work. That's your fee, your day fee figure out how many hours of a day you wanna work, divide it by how many hours. So for me, I would never work more than a six hour day, seven max, depending on what the job is. So if I wanted, I don't know, 30K, I don't wanna work any weekend, take away those 52 weekends. I also want a midweek break, take away all the Wednesdays. Like kind of plan your ideal life. Plan my ideal life. And for me, it's not ideal, that's, that's the life. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. I want to sleep and I want to rest and I want to be able to like, one day have a family and I don't wanna be a mother that's like, oh, I'll see my kids when I can between work. Like I want to be able to set up systems that are sustainable for myself. So I always, I found there's like two different types of clients for me. The ones that you can see there's opportunity to grow together. And then there's the ones that you know, they have the money, but they know you don't know your own self value that they'll gin you out of a fee. And for me, those second are the ones that don't value dancers or, or even though we're the ones that are blowing up their tune or whatever, but they're the ones that have the money. But the growers will pay you way more because they see the value in us doing it together. And what I would Ola was much rather, relationships. I would much rather build those relationships, yeah. get a lower fee, and yeah. you, when they grow, you grow together. So it's like um, figuring out the price, which at times, especially as a woman, sometimes we don't demand our fee. And, and that's the world that has societally put us in that position where we're like, am I, qualified? we'd go and get masters, doctorate before we then say, I'm qualified. But now I realized, right, you know what? I did a fine art degree. I had on that course, so many students that would literally do a madness and put it on a plinth. <laughs> now real serious and put it on a plinth and say, this is the blah, blah, blah. chatting, absolute madness. But then I realized in doing that, you're justifying your art, you're actually articulating your ideas, you're conceptualizing what it is that is your vision. And that's a skill. Like it doesn't matter if to me, I'll look at this and be like, what is that? Mm -hmm. But then in my second year, I said, yeah, is that what you are doing? I did it, I got a first that year. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not because I was blagging, I call it blagging, but blagging is a skill. And it's like the gift of the gab, we say it in a, in a way that is almost derogatory, but people that can chat and, and convince you of what it is they're doing, you're buying into a vision. And, and that is what for me in every room I've gone into has got me my money. Boom. Can, I, can I just ask something really quickly? No. I'm sorry. Um, 
we have to stop being apologetic about money as dancers. Please, please. <laughs> We have a talk in next event that we go through 60 with Rhymes, who's going to be talking about fin fin finances and how to talk about money, how to think about money, because I think no one teaches us how to how to do that. And I think we're very apologetic because we don't know it and we're scared of it, scared to ask about it. We all like to live life, eat food, you know, s sleep and stuff. I yeah. feel like we have to start like change the narrative as well to be apolog unapologetic. And one last thing, Rich Dad Poor Dad, I recommend that book because we are taught about employment and self-employment. We're not taught enough about uh, portfolio income, investment income, and all that stuff. And we deserve that. <laughs> so I would say educate yourself because these are, these are very important things that can really help and open your mind on different things. And also, just to add again, like another side to how this all might be sounding is that like we're talking about a lot of like scary money stuff and paying rent and no. all that, which is true. And there is a lot uh, in that as freelancers that we do have to worry about. Uh, you always have to be on. You always have to be thinking about the next job like these things are real and they are stressful. But what I will say is. Getting out of a like full time kind of paid job, which I think we've probably all done at some point, like a kind of nine to five, going freelance. The first thing in your mind when I did it anyway was very scared. Am I going to be able to pay rent? Right? H how can I do this? I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. What if? What if? What if? And then you start to it, you go and you're like, oh, I haven't got any money. Uh. And then you start to realize when things go all right, is that there's actually it takes off the ceiling on how much you can make, right? Because we can charge more per hour. We can we have more specialist skills than when I was working in a school or whatever. Like there's way less people that can do the specific number of things that I can do than there are teaching assistants. For Unique example. offering. Unique offering. And I think like, you know, at the school, I don't know what I was making, like 20 grand or maybe even less than that in a year. You know, let's say I was making like just under a th or around a thousand a month, let's say, when I was working at the school. So I was like, how am I going to be able to make a thousand a month going freelance? And then I was like, oh, but when things go well, I could make three grand a month. I, and if I can do that every month, that is a handsome fee. <laughs> so uh, I think it's like, you know, there are the, the, it's huge highs and low lows. Like it's scary when you have to pay your own rent and you might not be able to. It's scary when this bill comes, your, my car made a knocking sound the other day and he's like, boom, 400 quid. Like that's scary. But when someone hits you up and, and you have the confidence to demand a fee and they, like this is like something we've definitely all had where you you go, just to give a quick background for anyone that hasn't done freelance negotiation or whatever, always start with a higher fee than you think that you want and you always have a lower fee which is your walk away fee. And ask for the budget first. So you go, oh, oh, always ask for the, their, if they say, if they go first, it's like a Western draw. What's the if they say their budget <laughs> first and it's higher than you would have charged, take it, right? <laughs> um, but what you do is you say, right, one. my day fee would be, I don't know, 400 pounds. I'm going to ask them for five and walk away at three. So I'll take three. I really want four, but I'm going to ask for five. The best, best feeling in the world. Well, uh, bitter and sweet. Oh, I, I usually charge 500 quid. Cool. That's fine. That is a great feeling in the beginning. And then you realize they agreed too quickly. They probably had more than 500. Damn it. But it is a nice fee when you go, all right, I'm going to bump it a little bit, ask for that fee. And someone goes, yeah, you're worth it. Let's go. And you're like, oh, this is nice. Like you, you get your 500 quid for the weekend. You're like, Woo, I could do this all day. So I think there is a upside. Like you, you can make more money in freelance. The possibility is to make more. Because if you're on a contract, you're only ever going to make that every month. You're only going to make that per year without promotions or whatever. Because... That's what your contract says. When you're freelance, how hard you work is how, how, how much money you earn. And that can be bad or that can be amazing. Um, but also, with, don't, don't sleep on the portfolio careers. Like, yep. you can be working a nine to five. You can be freelancing in the evenings and your weekends. If you combine it. And combine it. And I tell you, as long as I would say to everybody, make two bank accounts so that you remember your taxes at the end Ooh. of the year. Because that 20% will lick Listen. you and it will come out of the sky when you forget, oh, I'm living lifestyle. But that comes at the end of every tax year. So definitely, I have an Excel sheet for my life. And I, every month, put in each month what comes in. It includes my salary for my job. It includes yep. my freelance work. At the last page of all of the sheets, it has my 
expenditure that my rent yeah my water my bills my blah 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 my food which is always higher than everything else because i want to eat um and then that comes out of every month so i know where i am for winter i know where i am for spring i know my peak points in the year so if i know right when it's my birthday which is the end of the year everybody's broke because it's christmas time right so for me during that time i need something in the autumn to sustain because i'm probably not going to work during christmas period so that's one thing that nobody tells you everything shuts down over Christmas, yep. which sounds obvious, but the first time, and then everything starts back up slowly in January. So December and January are low months for freelancers. But if you get the work in before that, you're budgeted. But yeah, yeah. I made that mistake two so years in a row. make your projection for the year for sure. And then that will give you a buffer. He needs a buffer. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, go, go right ahead. <laughs> Just to segue on back of that, that I normally time this my fee by four. If yes. just what my fee is, by times it by four. So then if I do get my times four fee, that job is going to cons- cover my whole year. It doesn't happen all the time. Is it like, let's be honest. But like, if it comes back down, at least know I've got two or three seasons, um, three um, um, terms covered. Yeah, just to have your back. Because if you want to do freelancing, just freelance only and not yeah and also maybe set up your own business account like i have a business account and i pay myself a salary from my own business bank account (laughs) and to avoid paying too much tax on it something that nobody told me growing up until i saw it on youtube one day and i was like let's try it theophilus bailey limited wow that's me that's my business everything that operates around me because i am my, my own business i pay my own salary from that boom and i just keep that going and then you can do that for other things as well that's so. my next what i'm working on business accounts there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah no just add my little two pence and um i think i know you kind of mentioned around it's okay to work a job as well yeah. um I think for me, I, I know like a big goal for me was like to just be dancing 10 years later. I think that's something that people don't talk about is that I know a lot of people that stopped dancing with a lot of, with a lot of love and they were way better than me and life reasons, they had to stop and continue. Like there's a session that I go to in Gloucester and there's guys there from over 50 still doing it and they were regular jobs and that's okay. Yeah. That's actually the foundation of our dance industry a lot of time is the people that keep going keep going to the events. And for me, that's a massive motivation for the work that I do, is that if I'm here 10 years later, still going, then I've done my job in a way. And that's how I drive that passion. And unfortunately, I know my partner and people around me, they have a go at me. I kind of got that sickening work ethic where, like dance also saved me in terms of money. Like I just focused on that thing like every day and, and I didn't go on holiday, but that was okay. Like my partner's always on me, like, we ain't gone nowhere. You know what I mean? You just want to just keep working, keep going. And that's what came me, like my mind kind of saying, and it just chipped away and, and I had a bunch of people. And I've seen it for other people that just believed in what I did. And was like, when I started, I used to work in universities. And my, I had the first, like, another job. And they were like, Jamal, you can take the day off and just go do that job. And then build up like that. And I remember my second job was with the West Midlands Police. And that was just because I was standing there talking to somebody talking about what I like to do. And then it went to that job. I also am very well, I'm from Birmingham and the pockets that I was in, that's how it kind of developed and growed and talking about certain classes and fit in different spaces. And then I got to luxury of, you know, of work or sit in a lot of conversations where I am the only black male that's ever been in that conversation mm-hmm. or the only other person that's ever been in that room. I sit there all day going, why are the artists not in this room? Why are these voices not in this room? And then that's what my, the passion of just going I still want to be here 10 years later. I'm still going to do all these paperworks. I'm dyslexic as crap. I don't know what this means, uh, investment principles, arts council. I don't know all of that, but I'm still here and I'm still going to talk and I might be able to pass something else on and just keep going. Because if I'm still here when I'm 40, when I'm 50, because even though I'm in them other rooms, I'm still in dance. I'm still in activity. I'm still here. This is all from a garage. This is not from the studio, this is not from the show. And just because someone said, you need to get out the garage, I never forget it. Sorry, I say garage, not garage. <laughs> Don't know why, that's too much hip hop, too much breaking. And just listening to people, you know, I saw so many breakers that were like, my scariest thing, and I just wanna share this, because I know there's a lot of people in the room. I know for me, 
breaking kind of saved me in a way. I never wanted to lose that. And if it was my day job, I saw so many people, they stopped loving it. They stopped exploring, they stopped playing. And I don't want people to ever lose that. Yeah. So don't ever stop playing, don't ever stop moving. Mm -hmm. Keep dancing. That's what I always say in any room that I'm in, yeah. keep moving and then you'll find where you go. Mm -hmm. These finances are over my head. <laughs> it's great. Take it on board. It's important. And I had to learn all them things. But I think the key is when you love the dance, you'll do that other stuff. You stand outside with a leaflet. Yeah. You do the spreadsheets. You learn how to produce. You learn how to work with different people in a room and have to deal with people's, oh, you know, my nan passed away and you've got to do a show in an hour. And you're like, nah, I need to take time to do this. And you're like, no one teaches you that. That's the big part when you're doing a show. It's not a dance, which is the hard part. It's everything else that comes yeah. with it. And now I work with artists and mentors in, in that way, whereas like we go for a piece and making their first piece. And what was the hard part? I never worked with people in a space and what that comes with it. Mm -hmm. And that's the same for when you're teaching. What are people bringing into that space? How are we making safe spaces? I think that's what DCD is about, right? How we make safe spaces for dancers and different movers. And I think that's the drive. And then everything, for me, I'm very lucky and fortunate that people believe in me to keep going because I'm no good at the Instagram and <laughs> T-Mobile. I can't do it. I respect it, but world class, world class. But, you know, that's not my story. But for the introverts, <laughs> you know what I mean? Shout out. But world class, what these guys are saying, and I feel it, and I wish there's a lot of, to take on there. Sorry, Mike. No, no, please. that's great. Don't Please don't be sorry. Um, yeah, I think, like, with the portfolio career and, and this, which I the thing that I think is the most important if you agree with this is like, it's just designing a life that makes you happy. You know, it's like you don't have to do a job that makes you unhappy because you can do a part-time job that makes you happy plus a bit of freelance or that full-time job that does make you happy. It's crazy. Like I went freelance five, six, seven years ago and I forget how long it's been. I'm more qualified to do way higher paying full-time jobs now just by all the stuff I've randomly done, free, like, uh, freelance, freestyling, freelancing. So it's like, you know, by, it's just about building the, <laughs> building like the life that you want and however that looks is okay. But I think the main bottom line for me is like, are you happy? If you're happy doing what you're doing and you can sustain yourself, nobody should be able to tell you nothing. Go on. I don't know if I should say it. Because <laughs> it's uh, right. Wait, we don't know what she's gonna say yet. Because like the question, the question also is: Are you happy or are you comfortable? Mmm. Mmm. I'll leave it there. <laughs> I don't. I'm not a fan of comfort. Oh yeah. There's a great saying like "I'm um, always happy, never satisfied," I, which I th like, think you should be. I just think there's no growth in comfort. Agree. That like you can do things that you're like, oh yeah, it will pay me. I know they'll just pay my salary. I'll get through the motions. And But you lose passion when you're in those kinds of spaces. And that's a big reason why I left the mainstream classroom because if anyone who's a teacher or has been in the education world, you don't do it for money. Mm. Like understand <laughs> it is not a job for money. But when you're hearing other teachers who have lost their passion for just genuinely connecting yeah. with the young people they're teaching, et cetera, that, it's hard to be in those kind of spaces and that can't be your driving force if it's if it's that reason. And I think for me, I think I've always thrown myself into uncomfortable spaces. And I was actually talking to a really good friend uh, yesterday um, about imposter syndrome. And for me, imposter syndrome isn't discomfort of knowing your own abilities. It's actually the fear of realizing your own capability. That's That's what you're terrified of because to actually sit in what your power is, is hard. It's really hard. And a lot of the time it's because we play, we're used to playing small. Mm -hmm. So when you're actually forced to be you fully, you're not used to that. And there's a, there's a bit of a shedding you have to go through. There's a bit of a, I call it an e like your ego has to die first mm -hmm. to, to get to your new you first. And I think, we don't shed in, uh, one of the things I think I loved lockdown for was the fact that everybody had an opportunity to isolate and go inward if we wanted to use that time for that. And for me, that was cocoon season on blast. Like I do that every year, March is my new year. And when it's the dark times of the year, I can feel the heaviness, especially in this country, God, it's dark and hit gray. But when the lighter days come, I can feel a shedding every year. And I think it's important to allow yourself to really declutter 
So I, I intentionally, like on a quarterly basis, I'll go through my Instagram, I'll go through my Facebook and I delete, I unfollow because I don't want to feed myself things that I don't need. So I, I will, like right now, I'm literally half my wardrobe is on my floor because I'm getting rid of things and it's not a spring cleaning, it's I don't need anymore. And I think that cycle, we, we naturally go through these cycles and these rhythms, but it's allowing ourselves to like really tap into what is blocking. And, and for me now, I'm just at a point where it's like, what are my actual necessity? And if I don't need it, including people and spaces. Most and, importantly, And people, jobs. <laughs> like if a job ever holds you hostage, that's a problem. If you can't walk out of a job, that's a problem. Big, you know, and I think I've never been in any job that could ever tell me, oh, well, next month you must. Mm. Nah, if it doesn't align, I don't care. I, d I would never sacrifice my integrity. And for me, integrity isn't being nice. We were, say we were saying this earlier. I'm kind, I'm not nice. Mm. Nice means you're gonna pander to a room, even if you don't agree with the sentiments. Nice means you're gonna bend your morals to fit it being palatable. Sometimes it is uncomfortable. Yeah. And sometimes we have to have hard conversations and I'm okay with being a disruptor yeah. because that's not comfortable because sometimes it comes with backlash and sometimes yeah. it comes with targets. And But I have to do that. Otherwise my spirit will feel drained and I am so like empty at that point that I have to just remove myself. That's when you see me go travel for nine months. Mm -hmm because I just have to recharge because yeah. it's taken so much. So I think that that space of really whittling and like discarding what isn't necessary, yeah. like do that as regularly as you need to and don't apologize. Bars. Um, do you guys mind if we do one more question, if that's okay, or one more topic, let's say, if that's okay with you guys. So what I was gonna ask, just I think it kind of rounds it off nicely, is I think it relates to something you said, although I can't remember exactly what it was that triggered this thought. But I think when, oh, it was about still being here, the whole yeah. pur purpose of what you said. <laughs> yeah, but I think like one thing that's important for me, you know, is like, uh, I, I don't wanna go into the whole history of what I do, but like with the capsule that I built, there's maybe three people on the planet that know the depths of like how hard it was in the last three years. And like, there's people that know some of the iceberg and there's some other shit that it's like, it's been, the last three years have been like the hardest time of my life by a long shot, right? And on top of that, building this thing. And I think now coming back into spaces like the dance spaces and, and actually I've like this year, I've been trying to like battle more and be involved more and do, I did open art surgery and all these type of things like putting myself back in those positions, like, I've been in situations where like being at a battle and just seeing people like do their thing and stuff, like I've nearly cried because I've been like, this is, it's worth it. You know what I mean? Like you see everyone happy, having fun and you're like, shit, like all those times I almost quit, like, and I didn't, it's worth it. And I think like getting back into it and being opposite some of these kids who, when I started dancing were in nappies <laughs> and to, for them to smoke me, it's like, I'm, I'm there like, you know, like all these young kids and like battling them and being a part of it and kind of in a way like asking for their respect in a way of like, I, I'm on the podcast talking about everyone, I'm doing what I do, but I also wanna be here in front of you, taking my butt kicking like everyone else to like be a part of this scene that I love so much and that's why I do this stuff, right? And I think it's almost like I've come back around to dance with a, a way more passionate why. Like, why am I battling? When I was 18, it was like, I don't know, I wanna win Just Taboo and uh, maybe then my life will make sense. Like, it didn't make any sense. Now, I don't care if it's like the smallest battle, like I'm there for a, a very passionate reason and I can enter and I can drive four hours to Manchester to enter a battle and get my ass kicked by a 18 year old and be like, what am I doing? But I'm like, I'm glad I'm here. Like I'm contributing, I'm, I'm a part of this thing. So I just wanted to get you guys to also talk about like, as much as we are transitioning out and doing other things, but like how important it is to not go out, out <laughs> and like to still be here and to still keep the core of why we do what we do. So yeah, any thoughts on that would be lovely. <laughs> Firstly, we give thanks for Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing all of that. Oh, man, I don't see it. like people like like friends like you inspire me to do what I do. You too, mate. Honestly, like again, like I bring back and to all of you guys too. And all of you guys. 
<laughs> that's what that's why I, I love london it's crazy it makes you crazy but it's just a lot you have people around you that just do stuff <laughs> that is the best description of london ever yeah. there's just so many people that do stuff <laughs> yeah and i love it like i wake up every day and if i waste my time on instagram i scroll right but i see just my friends do stuff and i'm like i want to do stuff <laughs> it's just yeah it's like I don't know. All my friends just bought a house. Whoa, how did you do that? And she sent me like a podcast, eight minutes. I'm like, whoa, amazing, you know? And you learn and keep growing. And I think I, I, get, I get so like passionate about it because like honestly, like, this year is for me all about relationship and people around me. How it's that like being like, uh, thanks to people where I am, you know? Like my, my biggest project, which is Regrowth with 60, would never like it would never happen without my great friend who trusted in my vision and freaking wrote the the whole arts council <laughs> application because i would never like i'm just not able to do it so it's again like just fostering these relationships with people that believe and trust in you and i think this is what drives me crazy it drives me crazy okay drives me good way <laughs> okay i think it drives me that was that was what i wanted to say and just keeps me wanting to go but today i had this situation where I just, I just kept on thinking on the way here. That person that I like really, really respect and like just insane for me to work with that person. I was going here and I was like, where are you going? I was like, oh, I'm going to Swindon, going to that talk and I hope I'm going to be able to inspire someone. I don't know, I'm like, I really hope it's going to be nice. And that person say like, yeah, of course, like, like you walk in inspiration. And I just, I just kind of like, uh -huh, what? And it's just like, I really had to take a moment, like for, obviously I said thank you and I left, but then like on the train I was like, how crazy that is that someone will say that. And sometimes you, you, we don't understand that the little things might inspire people, you know? And I think for me, it's that always. If I have one person coming to take my class and learn something, if I have one conversation that maybe someone can take something from or I can take from, I think it's just that constant exchange of not only dance, but like everything we're doing in life. I think for me, I love it and I just want as much of it in my life on the dance floor, in the conversation, in friendships, in supporting people, in being in places like this, I think for me that's just the force. Like I feel like I wake up every day and I feel like there's gonna be something today that's gonna just keep pushing. And or if, if it does not, that's okay too. That's a space for me. And then again, because I'm extroverted, but I need to recharge too. So that's okay, today was no interaction, great. Let me just focus on this so I can come out next next day and bring something to the table or or have someone someone share something with me. That's a big question. <laughs> um I just I think I just take play everywhere I go now. Like I never stop playing. I never stop learning. Like even part of ABC now, a big part of the academy is like you get to dabble for a course for two years. And like, I was that kind of child that just did all the arts and did all the things and played a lot. But also I understand the apprehensions and fears that parents have because I had a parent that had those fears for the arts and had those apprehensions. And I understand how important academics are for people that look like me because our struggle is going to be different in this world. So, but I want the access that art has given me for those young people. So it's kind of, giving my younger self the, the prep in, in everything that I'm placing myself in. And I think now positioning myself in a space where I can start having work not be so tiresome and, and less of my energy being actively in the work and it being more about my ideas working for me or my visions working for me and knowing that delegation is part of the work because yeah. when you, especially when you start a career freelance or independent, you're used to being the middleman and, and the, the boss and the, the worker and the performer. And it's hard to undo that work. So I think slowly like handing, I think the first time I watched my company's piece Motherland was 2019. And like, it was mad to sit in the audience yeah. and like be in the lighting box. And I had a rehearsal director take the piece. like. It's it takes time to give handover things, but I think it's just knowing eventually the body takes longer to recover and all of these other things. So it's repositioning myself, I think now is, 
I'm at a point where I'm losing the love for it being like just because sake, mm. you know, and, and now I'm, I'm happy to hand over mm. and impart and share. And I really believe in community and I really believe in us like not reinventing the will and collaborating. Like mm. I live in collaboration and yeah, collaboration doesn't have to exist with people that share your background. I think we all have yeah. intersections. So I live there in the art world now. Love it. Um, <laughs> um, I think there's a few like faces to that. Um, I think like, like you said, I think the external, the one thing I love about this culture, especially what I loved about breaking and, and I, I love it even more now I work in organizations and things like that is you can't just talk like this opportunity to stand in front of them. You've got to prove yourself and, and, and that's, and there's a beauty in that and there's a sharing in that, which is open, which is, which is kind of cool. But then I think like personally in myself, I'm my biggest critic and really that's a blessing and a damage as well. Like I, I don't really, sometimes don't care what other people think. I'm always like my worst, like come off the stage, like, oh, this, not whatever the battle, you know what I mean? Sometimes on stage, like, I don't actually like performing. It's just me on that stage and whatever. And I'm like, this is crap, man. Like, well, this ain't what, how I wanted it. And it's because that little inch of, uh, I, I didn't hit the same, I didn't hit that CC or whatever that could be. Um, and that finger just keep going. And that's actually just, that self picture, like I don't know if any anyway, of you guys had like this. When I was like a kid, I kind of had this image of what, like what I wanted to be. Yeah. And you pictured yourself, and that's the only thing that I'm battling. Like, have I got there? Like every inch of that road, and my do I start looking like that person? And sometimes I look back and I go, yeah, but I'm still getting started. So every day I wake up, and I'm still getting started, and just see where it is. So I think that's where, for me that just keeps it going and no matter them spaces. I just want to see more people do that. I think in this dance scene, there's more things that you can do. Like sometimes, especially with hip hop or breaking, whatever. If you do theater, now you're doing the cheesy stuff or you're, you're selling out or whatever that case. I don't think that's as much as it is, but you can do other stuff and that feeds what you do. And that doesn't make you less of a person. If you work in KFC, do that the best way you can do it, bro. Yep. Like talk to people like they're kings. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you can serve people, then that's your skill, that's your talent, and there's nothing less than that. Mm. You're not great because you won Rebel BC1. Mm. That doesn't make you a great person. Mm. I ain't done it, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably never gonna do it, but I think there's, there's a lot of champions, there's champions I know in this space, which do their job to a dime, and they're the people I wanna be like every day, and they're the people I respect, and they're the people that I love, so. Just keep doing that, if anyone sees this. Keep doing what you're doing. If it's just talking to someone on the bus stop on the street to make someone feel better, then you're dancing. If you're dancing on the bus stop while the bus is coming, <laughs> you're the bad boy, you get me? You know? <laughs> but I'll leave it there. Theo, you want to take us to the promised land? To the promised land, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I know I said God's The end of like, the geez. panel talk. <laughs> um, it's the promised land. Um, yeah, I think it, what I kind of live by encapsulates everything that everyone said, like, is. is a few things one is representation because that's what inspired me to get to where i am today um and consistency you know consistency uh one of my phrases or lines that i always say in my instagram stories if you guys follow me on socials is filled with the bullshit and focus like i live by that every single day because there's so much of it out there that could just filter your full process or your thinking to do certain things so that picture that dream or that idea of that person you want to be keep going because we don't know who we're inspiring who we're inspiring and also that's our integrity that's our own spark within ourselves that's our own love for ourselves so if that inspires that next person to put, be on that same or similar journey as yourself, you know it's coming from a good space. But so yeah. Boom. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you to DCD, Emily, everyone. Um, no. And yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's a wrap. <laughs> nice. Let's go.